Okay, so today I'm going to talk about repeated measures, and I'm going to talk about. Oh, I've got to move. Okay. That must have been something stupid I did. Anyway, repeated measures designs, uh, and which are actually a special case of something called a randomized block design. Um, okay, let's say you're interested in learning or forgetting, which is a pretty common thing that uh, psychologists are interested in. That's uh, it's what I do. I'm interested in learning, so change over time and, and behavior. Um, independent groups won't do. So far, we've talked about independent groups. So that's one, uh, like one way analysis of variance, different groups. Remember, group one, group two, group three, whatever. Or say a simple two by two, or two by three, or whatever. But you've got different groups in each cell, different groups of subjects. That's not going to work if I want to look at change over time, is it? Because I want to look at time one, time two, and time three. I can't really use independent groups. The way you would typically do this is you would test the same people, or rats, or chickadees, or dark eyed juncos over and over and over again. And then you compare how they're doing at time one, time two, and time three, etc. And you get what's called, of course, a learning curve, right? And then you see if the change, uh, if, if their performance is getting better. By the way, a steep learning curve means something is easy, not that it's hard. Everyone misuses that and it drives psychologists insane. Think about it. If learning is on the x-axis, sorry, if time is on the x-axis and learning is on the y-axis, if you go up very quickly and the curve is steep, you've learned very quickly. Ergo, the steep learning curve means it's easy. Anyway, it drives me just out of my mind. So we're going to look at any kind of change over time. This would be true, too. It doesn't really matter what you're doing. I mean, learning is the, the obvious example to me because it's sort of what I'm interested in. But there's all kinds of examples throughout uh, psychology, biology, et cetera, where you're going to have look at changes over time, right? Growth rates at different, at different times, et cetera. So if we're going to look at change over time, we're going to have to test the same subjects more than once. So you're going to get something that looks like that. So let's say it's retention intervals. You can talk about that as <coughs> time, so you can do a list of words, then you have a retention interval, and then you have to do recall. And in five minutes, one hour, and 24 hours, except now we've got group one, group one, group one. It's all the same group now. So people are tested once, and then they're tested again, and then they're tested again. Right? OK. Make sense so far? Yeah? OK. Now, there is a real problem here, and, and hopefully a couple of you have picked up on this already. And that's that observations are, in fact, no longer independent. And I keep saying you can't violate the independence of observations. But now they're not independent. Right? Like, if I'm testing uh, now, and then I, this time, another time, like, and I have the score from Chris, and I look at Chris's score at one hour is dependent on his score at five minutes because it's Chris, right? Sean's score at 24 hours depends on Sean's score at one hour. They're completely dependent. It's the same person. Oh, and that's always I'm always you know rambling about how or ranting. I wouldn't say rambling. How important it is we can't violate that assumption. Well, instead, let's just throw it into the model. We'll just say, okay, we got the same people, or the same subjects, or observations, or whatever. Uh, participants. I hate, hate that the APA makes us call them participants. Because I'm an old man yelling at five. They changed something in 1996, and it's still bothers me. 23 years later. It's <laughs> You shouldn't say you're running subjects, you're testing participants. But whatever. So our model now looks like this. This is going to look very, this looks very similar to the sort of standard one-way analysis of variance model, which was x equals mu plus tau plus epsilon. We just now have pi in here, right? x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. So we have any score equals the grand mean plus the treatment effect. In this case, it would be retention interval, right, or time and error. And then we have this new thing called pi. Now, think about this. What this has done 
There's only one place this could come from. So it split error off and made the error term, the epsilon term, a little smaller. Does that make sense? No. Well, think about this. Before we had x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. Now we're going to bring in subjects. And I'm just going to call them subjects. Okay. So error used to be the only thing that accounted for the individual. It was all individual differences. But what we've done now is we've got something else. And the only place, because we have tau still, we still have epsilon. So we still have mu. It's not really variation. It's everybody's the same score. There's only one place that epsilon can come from. Uh, sorry, the, the pi can come from, that variation can come from. It can only come from epsilon. So it breaks that down into something smaller. You have two parts now. So now we've got new epsilon, which is just anything left over, and the pi term, which is, so it's split off. So it's gone from before we had this, u plus tau plus epsilon, and now we have this. So it's come from there. So it's made it, it's actually made the epsilon value smaller because it's it, it come from the same place. It's all come from themselves. Make sense then? Good. So what we've done, we just said, well fine, we, we the same subjects, just put that in the model. We're gonna treat subjects like they're another variable. The other day I was saying thinking of subjects as a variable is a strange thing to think of, but really they're just different levels of the variable people. Right? So there's an Erica level and there's a Dana level and, 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 and you know, uh, an Angie level. And there's all these different levels. Is Angie bothered? Okay. Some people don't like it in the short form. Sorry, Dave, excuse me. You know, so it's uh, you just these different levels of people. Just a variable. So the design entry now looks like this. Subject one, subject two, subject three, subject four. You see, I'm considering subjects as variable. And then retention intervals. So I've just considered subjects now as a variable. Now we've decreased epsilon. And we want as little error as possible. We want to explain as much variance as we can. But we pay for it. There's no free lunch. And there are no free reductions in variance. A horrible turn of a phrase that was. <laughs> so we pay for it by when this error thing splits off, some degrees of freedom go with it. And take and we think about it, if you look at an F table in the back of a textbook, the smaller the number of degrees of freedom the bigger the critical value. So you have to find a bigger f value <coughs> to find something significant. So if you just take a look at any f table in your book, you'll see when you have a small number of degrees of freedom, you have a bigger critical f value, the thing you have to exceed to find significance. So you've made it harder to find significance in one way, but the way you've made it easier is the thing that you're going to probably end up dividing by, the thing that we have this extra variation that's left over is going to be smaller. So it's almost always worth it to do this, if you can, if you have the same subjects. You can't just pretend you have the same subjects. Okay? So in a design like this, where we have, this has four subjects and has three levels of an independent variable. We could actually do this with a standard uh, one-way analysis of variance. You can violate an assumption, but the numbers don't know that. So as a point of sort of an academic exercise, you could. The one-way analysis of variance for this case would have two degrees of freedom for rotation interval, nine for error, and 11 all told, 12 observations. For the repeated measures case, we have two for rotation interval, three for subjects, because we have four subjects, 11 total degrees of freedom, and what's left over is six. So that's how you get error degrees of freedom. So you see what's happened here is that now you're 
Before, your F task was going to have 2 and 9 degrees of freedom. Now it's got 2 and 6. And when you look in a, in a, in a table, in a book, you'll see that, that, that 2 and 6, the critical value, is, is a bigger number than 2 and Sorry, two and nine. Is, yeah, two and six is a bigger number than two and nine. Bigger critical value. So you've paid for that. You paid for the reduction in error by having a better, bigger critical value. Okay. So any design has a finite amount of variance, variation, and a finite number of degrees of freedom. That doesn't change. That, that, that design had, 12, had 11 degrees of freedom, and the numbers vary only so much. The amount of variance that happens doesn't depend on if we have repeated measures or not, because the numbers don't know where they come from. But when we account for the variance changes, and then we account and we partition the variance and partition the degrees of freedom, that changes. So we've to partition the variation and we partition degrees of freedom just a little further. That's all that's happening. So mean squared for retention interval, or mean squared treatment, we'll call it that, is the same for both analyses. And in fact, on your next assignment, there is, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do, well, I'm not going to ask you, I have asked you, I am requiring you to do, I give you a batch of numbers, and I said, do it as a one-way analysis of now do it as repeated measures, and you'll see that the mean square treatment is exactly the same for both. And we'll go over that after I finish up today. I'll show you how to do this. It's really easy. So the question is, is the reduction in mean squared error, the thing we divide by, going to be worth the loss of degrees of freedom? And the answer is almost always yes it would be exceedingly unlikely for it not to be worth it. Because you've accounted for variance. When you can take variance away, that's good. Error variance. Right? Because remember, you're dividing by something. So you make you're dividing mean squared retention interval by mean squared error. Yeah? And if you're doing that, if you make the thing on the bottom, the denominator, smaller, it makes the fraction bigger. It's like the final value bigger. That's good. We want a big number there. Okay. All right. Questions so far? Okay. So let's think about this a little bit. Is it realistic for you to think that x equals u plus tau plus, plus pi plus epsilon? Because should pi interact with tau? You're thinking, wait, I don't know what that means then. What that means is, let's say we're doing a learning experiment, and some people forget faster than others. If, you, if, if, if the, the, the level of subject, the person, changes the main effect of retention interval, that's an interaction. It's reasonable to think there's an interaction. Some people have better memories than other people. That's not really, you know, that's not really groundbreaking knowledge. The overall shape of everybody's forgetting curve will be roughly the same. But some people forget things faster than others. That's an interaction. So it makes more sense, in fact, for us to assume we have a tau by pi interaction. Right? So we should put that in the model. So that really should be there. In the special case where we have the same subjects tested over and over again, we should probably assume there's an interaction. It's just reasonable. It may be the case that this that there probably is. Right? That's saying different variables affect different people differently. That's not really groundbreaking or controversial. That's how the world works. So it's really a, it's just a sensible assumption to, to actually say it, it works like that. So the model now is going to change. It's x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus tau pi. So that's the model, x equals mu plus tau plus tau pi. Where did epsilon go? 
There's no extra one? Is it a mistake, Dave? There's no error anymore. There's, not, there's nothing left over. That's all that epsilon is. It's like, oh yeah, and the other stuff. <laughs> that's all epsilon ever is. Like, yeah, that's the other stuff. Um, there isn't any other stuff left. By thinking of the interaction of tau and pi, we've now said, uh, no, there's nothing. Left. There's no error. There's no leftover stuff. We can give it everything in name. We know where everything comes from. Because think about this. If I was doing a learning experiment with all you guys, and they're like a, a yeah, let's do learning, like, or, or forgetting, doesn't matter. Let's make it forget. Give you a list of words, and then I'm going to test you at five minutes and one hour. And we can say, okay, well, first of all, five minutes and one hour should account for some of the variance. The fact that you're different people should account for some of the variance. The fact that different people forget at different rates should account for some of the variance. What's that? No, that's everything. <laughs> that's all of it. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. So there's no epsilon in this model. So we've exhausted the degrees of freedom. Once we've done that to the variance, like there's, there's no degrees of freedom left. You can't have a zero for degrees of freedom. We're just treating S subjects as another variable. That's all we're doing. It's odd to think of individual, I mean, you know what you use? You, you can use names, I guess, if you want, but you just give people numbers. One to how many there are. When you do an analysis like this. I said the other day, it's a good habit to get into, even if you're not doing repeated measures, just put a subject number for each person, and that's why, because it's going to make the analysis a lot easier if it is a repeated measure. So now, the funny thing is, we used to just call this error, and it had six degrees of freedom. Now we're just calling it retention interval by subjects. We're just giving it a new name. The calculation, in fact, is exactly the same as it would be for doing a uh, mean squared error for repeated measures. Which you would, I'm not going to worry about how you do that by hand. But the point is, we now have retention interval subjects, retention interval by subjects. Two, three. Two times three is six. Two times five is six. Oh, 11 total. Good. We got no more degrees of freedom. We can't have any more terms. Right? We have, we, are, we have no more terms. We are termless. Well, there's 12 observations oh. in this study. Okay. So there's 11 degrees of freedom. Yeah, I don't know about what we're done. <laughs> there's no more degrees of freedom left. We can't partition it. We've partitioned degrees of freedom, and variance comes with degrees of freedom. They travel together. Good question. So how does this kind of thing work? Um, our error term now, because we have to worry about what, what do we divide by what in the analysis of variance. We're going to take the mean squared for retention interval and divide by what? There's nothing there called mean squared error. What are we going to divide by? Well, we actually divide by the treatment by subjects interaction. Kind of like, remember that stuff about fixed and random factors the other day? Subjects are actually, we're treating them as a random factor. And because we treat them as a random factor, the expected values work out that we end up with the expected values for For mean square treatment, it's still going to be this. The expected value for mean squared subjects is going to equal O oh, plus this. Okay. Remember that from the, when you have a mixed model? <coughs> mean squared for subjects is just going to be pi. And the expected value for mean squared for subjects by treatment equals tau by pi. Oh, we divide this by this and it isolates treatment. Yay! And don't worry, it's not something you have to always work out to be the expected values. The beautiful thing about this is there's a trick I'm going to teach you over the next couple of weeks. 
It makes it so you can always figure out your error terms. We don't test the subject factor. How could we? <coughs> what are we going to divide this by? We can't isolate it. So we can't test it. And a lot of people find that unappealing. It's like, you're just going to leave it there? It is subject to fact that you're going to just leave it there? Yeah, we can't test the mean square for subjects. Um, there's no proper error term. There's no, nothing, the expected value of mean squared subjects is just pi. We don't have anything we can do with that. We can't divide by anything to, to, to see how much extra variance that's accounted for. There's no error term with the correct expected mean square. And also, who cares? You would be coming up with the groundbreaking thing that people are different from each other. You know, different <coughs> individuals are different. Ooh, better call nature and science. They'll both want to publish that. It's not interesting. So practically, it's not interesting. And theoretically, you can't do it anyway. So who cares? So you just move on. You don't test it significant because it isn't, it can't be tested be statistically significant, and it's practically meaningless. <laughs> so who cares? You hope it's a big value, by the way. The expected value for subject, or sorry, the, the, the means for subject. <coughs> you want to look at that and go, oh, big number. That took out a lot of variance. Yay. But you don't test it. Why don't you test it? <coughs> Imagine writing that in your results section. Also, it turns out individuals are different from each other. If that's your only conclusion when you present your thesis, no, actually, for a lot of people who do their thesis, nothing really works. <laughs> that's okay. Speaking of thesis presentations, tomorrow the biology students are doing their uh, poster presentations <coughs> in the CC uh, in this sort of hallway kind of thing. And there's a lot of cool stuff goes in. Between 10 and 1, you get time. Pretty cool stuff. I'm going. Which probably makes you want, not, not want to go. <laughs> All right. So, questions about repeated measures. The repeated measures are a special case of something called a randomized block design. You're saying, why didn't you tell us what the general case first? Because it's easier to understand the general when you think about the specific first. Right? At least as far as I'm concerned. I may be wrong, but it's my class. So let's talk about something that's more of a general version of this called a randomized block design. So remember matched pairs or a correlated t-test, which we use for repeated subjects? So in that case, you might match people up on a variable. So you can use matched pairs of subjects. Like you say, okay, we're going to use, I don't know, some kind of heart rate uh, drug test. Mm -hmm. So you find two people that have exactly the same heart rate, and then you give one the drug and one a placebo, and you compare those two, and you treat that as one, sort of one subject. It isn't one subject. We kind of treat it that way. Right. So we match subjects on something like the dependent variable. Almost always, in fact, the dependent variable. So you better, it better be a damn important variable because you've now made your two groups or three groups or five groups, whatever, be completely different on everything else. So it, very often this is some physiological measurement. Okay. So we can do this now instead of pairs, we can do it with triplets or, or more. So we can do the same thing with repeated analysis of variance. We can kind of treat subjects as or or groups of subjects that are exactly the same on some variable as one, I'm going to call it one block. So what you need is something called homogeneity of experimental units. What that means is that if I, for some reason, you three guys, I'm going to put you in one, what we call a block, you now, be, you now must be on some level exactly the same. Okay. Well, everything else is going to be different, but I've measured something about you and you're all the same, so I'm now going to say you're the same. So you have to be the same to begin with. And that's why you measure to begin with the stars. I'm not saying you're not all individual <coughs> and that are important. 
You're all wonderful. Okay, so Nash, you three up, and then you three up, and you three up on something. I don't know what. Okay, Probably any variable I pick, somebody's going to be offended. So I'm just going to leave it where it is. <laughs> you know, like, you can't pick a variable. Like, I, I don't know. So I'm just going to leave that. Make up your own variable. Like, if I said something like, you know, I don't know. IQ, you'd say, so you think I'm in a stupid group? You know, I, I know that's going to happen. <laughs> Somebody's going to say, so I'm just leaving it alone. <coughs> so this can be achieved in a few ways. We can actually do something cool with, with uh, say, if we had rats. Now, now you're going to think I'm calling you rats. Um, if we have litter mates, we can say they're all the same. They all treat, uh, they all have the same hormonal environment in utero. Right? Sure, that's good. And let's say we're doing something about hormones and uh, spatial processing. Sure. Now, matched pairs we could do or twins. Sure. Right? Those are good examples as well. But usually we just match up a block of people or subjects of some sort. And we go from there. So what we're, we've done here is we've called what's called blocking. This is what's and the thing we're blocking on is what's called a nuisance variable. It's a variable we know is important. It accounts for a lot of variance, but we know it's going to get in the way of us understanding what's going on with the real the, the, the independent variable we care about. So we're going to block on this nuisance variable. And it's going to reduce epsilon, reduce error, give us greater power, like we talked about before with, with the repeated measures. When you think about it with repeated measures, the nuisance variable is the individual being tested over and over again. It's the individual. So we account for the variance due to different individuals. Here what we have is something we've locked on, whatever the hell we do. The structural model, in fact, is almost exactly the same, except we go back to that original one. We don't have the special case of tau times pi. Because when I say you're the same on one variable, I do know, in fact, you're different on all kinds of other things. And I can't say that your level of whatever the hell it is I've, had, I've, I've matched you on works exactly the same in all of you. So now I'm just going to go back to the original structural model that's x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. So that's any score equals the grand mean plus the treatment effect plus the effect of being in a block, plus the residual. Residual or error. You'll hear those terms being used interchangeably. OK. We have some assumptions here. Uh, first of all, the assumption is that the treatment affects sum to zero. Well, they always do. That's something we always start with. That the effect of blocks is normal and independent with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared sub pi. The that the error is normal, independent, has a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared sub epsilon. But there's nothing there about any interactions. Okay, there's nothing about interactions there. And epsilon is independent of pi. So the leftover variance that we have is independent of what block is. It doesn't matter what, what, what block you're in, doesn't change the error. That means there's no interactions in these kind of models. There can't be any interactions between blocks and anything left over. In other words, when you look at a, a, at a graph, the lines can't cross. Yes. Sorry, can you specify that one more time? There can't be an interaction between between error. That's what's anything right. left over. So there's you three or block. Right. So there can't be any interaction between anything left over. The effect of being Dana, the effect of being Chris, the effect of being Lucia. That can't interact at all with what block you're in. So if, if I look at the elevation of regression due to being Dana. 
it doesn't save because else I can't say anything about what happens in block two. Okay. Now that's kind of you're thinking that's kind of tenuous. Yeah, it is. In fact, it's it's a ridiculous assumption, but it's the only way to make the math work. Um, we can't really violate that assumption too heavily. You can violate it a little. Now, I'll use an example in a sec to give you a feel for this. What does NIV mean? Normal and independent. Mm -hmm. Normal and independent? Yep. So there's also no interactions, no tau by pi interactions. Remember, look at, the, look at the model. x equals mu plus tau plus pi plus epsilon. That means that when I have a, I get a graph of block one, block two, and block three, the lines can't cross at all. They, they, in fact, they should all be parallel. So I have an example here coming up. If what, what we do? What if there are interactions between tau and pi? Well, it's actually going to make epsilon increase because the only place it can go, that variance can go, is in epsilon. It decreases the physical power. So if you actually violate that assumption, it's not like you're going to say something stupid. Like that, oh, there's, there are psychics, but you're going to miss that maybe there's psychics. <laughs> so you're going to miss something that might be important. There's no psychics. <laughs> Just to be sure. So you're going to lose power. You're not going to make false positives, but you're going to get more false negatives. So <laughs> how do we avoid this? Well, don't have them. And of course, you don't know if you're going to have them unless you have the data, and the thing is, you can't test if there's a significant interaction because there's no way to do it because there's nothing in the model. About it. Oh, well then what do we do? Thoughts and prayers? Apparently stops gun violence. <laughs> I kid. That might have been a mildly political statement. Um, <laughs> just mildly. But what can we do? Well, you know what you can do is you can do an exploratory data analysis. So here's an example. We have three blocks. Um, we have three teaching methods. This is my example here. Three teaching methods of teaching a foreign language. Okay? Or a second language. So we're going to teach a second language. And you might think probably that previous language experience would play a role here. Right? So you think about, it. let's say people that only took, how long did you take French? To grade 10, is that correct? Grade 10. In English? It's only grade 9. So, sad. So some people have only taken French up to grade nine. Some people did French immersion, and some people are francophones. Okay. Now, one would imagine that if we're having three different methods of teaching French, that there's going to be there's a nuisance variable there, and it's previous knowledge of French. Right. Unlike any other subject, a language subject is like learning a language, like spoken written language. Previous experience matters a great deal, right? Because if you step into a language class and you already speak that language, it's a joke. You sit there going, oh. this is my experience. My daughter going into French in school, and she can speak French better than her teachers. She's like, oh, come on. Eventually, she just became a tutor for a little bit. So on the other hand, if you've only gone up to grade nine, and you go into the university French class, or you go up to, you did, so let's say, immersion. Different things. So we're going to block people here. We have nine subjects, nine data points, right? And we'll say this is uh, this is the low level of experience. This is the medium level of experience. This is the high level of experience. And we have three teaching methods. One is just standard teaching method. I don't know what the hell it is. Method two. What could method two be? I don't know. Uh, Okay, yeah, 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 oh, sure, sure. They're, they're also using uh, uh, internet. And then the third group uh, are doing it very intensively. They're only taking one class at a time, but they're doing it for like a three-week period and six hours a day, the only thing that are, not six, a lot, actually work with the way the person You probably do four hours a day. Wait, so we're, we're looking at the same thing, but we're just doing Three different block groups. Yes, yeah, so that's different experiences with the language. Right, and also three different methods. Yeah, because we, we care about the methods. Yeah. Do the methods work or not? Are they different? So 
So like if we took, okay, so let's say we just blocked our group from the beginning by age and didn't consider level of whatever, then we would have an interaction? We would have, we have problems that we'd have because previous language experience. Like yeah. I said, unlike anything else, if you walk into a language learning classroom, you only speak the language. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to identify, if like, okay, so I'm trying to imagine that as a graph, and if that's the kind of thing where, like, although it's super obvious to say it, yes, if, yes. We, if we graphed it, would that be the kind of interaction that we're of trying to Actually, say no. The interaction we're trying to avoid here is, in fact, the interaction that there is up here. Note that what happens in the group on top, when we're going to say that's the group that actually you're bilingual. Turns out using the apps isn't helpful. It actually drops them down. Yeah. Whereas doing, the, doing it intensely helps better than anybody. This group go up, this group go up, this group go down and then up. But you know what? It's an ordinary interaction. I'm not, I wouldn't be too concerned. If those lines start crossing, you can't do this. The problem is you don't know if you can do this until you've collected your data. So you've got to be damn sure when you use randomized block design that this nuisance variable is not going to interact with your independent variable that you care about. Right? By the way, that idea of the last one, method three, if you just studied one subject at a time intensely for three weeks, um, there was a proposal, geez, eight or nine years ago at our university to do that. You would take one course at a time for three weeks, and all you would do would be that class for three weeks. You would do nothing else. And then you move on to another class. And it would have been awesome. People didn't want to. So just think about the, you know, history of psychology. Huh. What if we all went to Germany? You're not taking any other classes. <laughs> and did it. Summer classes that are convinced. There are summer classes like that, yeah. Anyway, you really don't want to is the basic consensus around here so <laughs> Would have been pretty cool. But also, let's say in this case, we can look at this example and say, look, we expect high experience to be better than medium experience, to be better than low experience, that's good. Something weird happened here with this group, but generally maybe we find an effect, we're okay. So I wouldn't be too concerned if this was what my exploratory data analysis looked like. On the other hand, if the lines start crossing, then we know we have an interaction there, and it's, we're going to get a lot of error. Because that's where interactions go. They would go to error. So the randomized block is, a, like I said, the repeated measures is a special case of randomized block. Because with repeated measures, we actually know that it's the same person. So the blocking thing. We have, of course, we have homogeneity experimental units. You know, so we have the same person tested over and over again. So, what if we had more than one repeated measures variable? Retention intervals and different type, types of memory tests, implicit tests and explicit tests. All right. Sure, what up? In fact, that's a Calvin Shackler start, 1982. <laughs> that's the design. Implicit test, explicit test, five minutes, one hour, 24 hours, and I think they also had seven days in there. Great. It's a very common approach. Is that just hair twirling? Or what? No, it's just twirling. Okay, that's good. As long as I know, I don't see very well, and I see a hand, but I thought I saw some <laughs> movement. I wasn't sure if it's hair twirling. That's cool. I will now ignore you. Um, so. What's the model look like here? Well, it's actually mu plus alpha plus beta plus alpha beta plus pi plus alpha pi plus beta pi plus alpha beta pi. Done. There's no error. What? This is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, this is ridiculous? No, it's ridiculous. No, it's not. What's wrong with it? How long it is. <laughs> oh, man. That's easy. Think about it. We got A, B, and then we got subjects. And then we have to do the interactions of all those. Done. Yeah, actually, it's a long lots of stuff up there. <laughs> There's lots of stuff up there. There's lots of weird things that I don't recognize in an alphabet I don't know. You didn't learn the Greek alphabet in grade 9? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. Perhaps.
so let's just specialize. <laughs> <laughs> Grade nine Latin. You also go a little Greek. No Latin. Okay. <laughs> what? You're a little bit older. I was the only school in London that actually taught it. So. Oh, okay. The coolest thing is that this great teacher, and now we found each other on Facebook. She's like a thousand years old. <laughs> so, no, she must be. I'm fifty three, so she's got to be like, and she was that age then, so she's got to be like ninety, and she's still exactly the same as she was. It's very cool. Or someone's done a really good job impersonating her. Why would you impersonate my old teacher, Miss Maggie? <laughs> but now when she said, you know, now when they, like I sent her a message once, she said, you know, the Latins really helped me out a couple of things, so I'm going to let you know. And thanks, I said, Th thanks, Miss Mayhew. And she said, you know, you can call me Joanne. I said, no, I don't think I can. <laughs> I really can't, I can't do that. And she was awesome. What a teacher. There's a lot of terms here, as Chris has pointed out. <laughs> um, and many potential error terms. All these things with subjects. How do we know what to test with what? Are we going to have to work at expected values of mean squares for all these? Well, you could if you wanted to. If you're the kind of person who enjoys that kind of thing. By the way, I have a friend who enjoys that kind of thing. Mm. But there is a way to do this. And it's a little trick. I'm going to assume there's only 10 subjects here. The first thing you do is you list your subjects. So then you list one of the independent variables, your first repeated variable, then you do an interaction. Then your next, M, M is memory test type, that's what I call it. M times S, M times RI, M times S by RI. And how do we know what to test with what? The thing that's below it, that has the thing you're interested in, so retention interval and subjects. For some reason, like so many weird things with, that are vaguely mathy, the world just is beautiful and it works that way. So while it is, you're right, there's a lot of terms there, a lot of potential error terms. In fact, we have three different error terms here. It's actually easy to do. We don't test any of these things with subjects in it because they're uninteresting. They're actually error terms. So I said assume 10 equals 10, so we get nine degrees of freedom here, two for retention interval, two times nine is 18. And it's really just very straightforward. That's a thing that's called Yates order. Yates, Brent Yates, one of the people who first studied analysis of variance, said that you should order your, when you do analysis variance summary table, order the, 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 the uh, source of variation degrees of freedom like this, and then you'll never make a mistake on what your error terms are. Yeah? So, because n equals 10, and they're doing the implicit and the explicit yeah. and on three yeah. different times. That's correct. That's 6, so it's the 6 times 10 minus 1. Yeah. Okay. So we have, because you, you have 60 observations, yeah. so you have 59 degrees of freedom to the total. Now break them down. We're going to do a lot of these over the next month, <laughs> and you will learn to love it. Yeah, you'll learn to do it. All right, questions on this before I show you some stuff about it, how to do some of the stuff on SPSS? Because it's pretty, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. All right.